This program was paid for by Water of Life Church. From Water of Life Ministries in Plano, Texas, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is speaking through his servants to the world. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. Let us join Doyle Davidson and others of Water of Life, sowing the Word of God in spirit and in truth. Hello, I'm Doyle Davidson, servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, ministering locally to the body of Christ in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, sent by God to your house to declare unto you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, tell us what the gospel is. How that Jesus Christ died by our sins, according to Scripture. He was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. Spread the Lord's upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, send me to heal the broken hearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight to the blind, Set at liberty them that are bruised. Amen. The word is neither even in your heart nor in your mouth. is a word of faith which I preach. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation. Everyone that believes it to the Jew verse and also to the Greek therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. Thank God. I want to welcome everyone on live stream and Roku and other devices to this broadcast. Paul Peters, co-host to my left. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. And how are you today? Doing well. Well, you know, water of life is always moving forward. Back in the tough days, the tough days, beginning in 04, through all of them, we never backed up. We fought. You couldn't see it. But I could. I could see progress every time. And we we that we made progress. It was a wonderful thing to watch the Father, Jehovah, and his son, the man Jesus Christ, at work in our lives. Thank God. Amen. A great, great blessing. So in 09 and 10, uh, I became aware, not me, but my staff, researchers, about ancestors that I knew nothing about. Since that time, they've developed uh, more and more <coughs> present to me through various avenues. And now, what I said in a way, the last Sunday of June, that my, that my ancestors came to America so I could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some of those distant cousins and those early ancestors have showed up. Sherry, Anthony, Thank God. That's one name I've been told. I think there's a couple more, but I'm not going to speak because I don't know. But last week, on Saturday, we talked about Roger Williams. And I'd heard a lot about Roger Williams. But out of all of this, I can see that Roger Williams was a man of God that had a revelation of the order of the church. And it's amazing. He had a revelation of what had to come before the church would ever be put in order. 
he had a revelation of what had to come before God would build up Zion. That's Psalm 102. And that is a set time. It says that God will build up Zion. Roger Williams, who was not related to me at all, had that revelation, that perception of the, God, of the church of Jesus Christ. What a blessing to, to talk with someone that is a, well, a descendant of Roger Williams. Today, we're going to talk about your, and I'll talk some, read about, what's his name? John Coggershaw. Roger Coggershaw? Yes. And Chad Ch Brown. Right. Right? Correct. All right, I'm going to let you read if I be allowed to make a comment, you know I will. All right. All right. Paul Peters. Let's go. John Coggeshaw was born about 1601 in Essex, England, to John and Anne Coggeshaw. His father was referred to as John Coggeshaw, so they were both John Coggeshaw, junior and senior. Amen. And her will and her, and his mom's will dated April 16th, 1645. She said, now dwelling in New England, my house and lands now at Sible Hittingham, together with the legacy given him by his uncle, John Butter. She also named his children in her will, John, Anne, Mary, Joshua, and James, leaving them an inheritance. At the time of the date of her will, she was living at Castle Hittingham, a village northeast of Essex. John was a successful merchant in the silk trade in England. John and his wife Mary, with their children, sailed for New England on June 23rd, 1632, on the ship, the Lion. That's amazing. The Lion, huh? Right. That's what Great Britain's called. Right. You know, I have great respect for these people I mean. that left their country coming to the United States, which was not the United States. Thank God to find a place where they can worship God. These people are uh, put down by ignorant people that know nothing about them. I have read and heard it said they were all deists. That could not be true. No one, no deist would hazard his life or her life to get on one of those small ships, boats. When I saw the replica of the Mayflower, having been in the U.S. Navy four years, and went across the Pacific on a small Carrier, transport, escort, Cape Esperance, 88. My goodness, small. And then I see a replica of the Mayflower. I thought these were the most courageous people that could ever live believing in God, Jehovah, and Jesus and would get on that little boat. I call it a little boat. <laughs> and come to a nation they'd heard about. Incredible to me. And don't think I think I'm a big time maritime person. A, a big sailor, you're wrong. I was at sea 15 days. I was a land person, a hospital corpsman. I went through boot camp in San Diego, California Naval Training Center. I started at the very bottom, thank God. And I had great jobs every place in the Navy. 
I mean, I worked right up to work for the cap for Captain Medical Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, Marshal Cohn, R.B. Shepherds at first, then Marshal Cohn, and their boss was Vice Admiral Callahan. That's where I worked. What a blessing, but nothing compared to what I see from our, my ancestors that got on those boats and came over here because they trusted God. Paul? Amen. They came over here on the ship, the Lion, arriving in Boston about three months later on Sunday, September 16th. Three more children would be born in New England. They originally settled in Roxbury, where he became a free man and was elected as a member of the church at Roxbury. Roxbury was one of the several towns settled by the Winthrop fleet. Upon their arrival, upon their arrival, 11 ships of about 1,000 Puritans, led by John Winthrop, came to New England during the summer of 1630. This group of Puritans formed the nucleus of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, of which John Winthrop became governor. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, probably by simply sheer numbers, absorbed the previous colonies, such as Salem and Plymouth, under their jurisdiction. They incorporated their strict religious beliefs into their system of government. May I, may I say something? Sure. I'm reminded of Deborah, a prophetess, and she said to some person that he should go. He was a leader. He should go and do something. It's been years since I read this. And she said, well, I'll go with you. Well, he said, if you'll go with me. She said, I'll go with you, but you will get no honor out of this. Did you know that, that group of people came 10 years after the Mayflower and after uh, others, and they ended up not getting much honor? Right. Amen. Go ahead. They incorporate the Massachusetts Bay Colony incorporated their strict religious beliefs into their system of government and ruled with the same oppressive authority that so many had sought to escape in England. Many separatists who had came for religious liberty fled or were driven from the Massachusetts Colony's jurisdiction. The Coggeshalls later moved to Boston and became neighbors with William and Anne Hutchinson. John also became a supporter of Anne Hutchinson, who did not adhere to the religious doctrine of the Puritans and believed in a covenant of grace, not of works. The Hutchinsons were expelled from Massachusetts, as was John, not long after. That's interesting. She believed in grace, not works. Right. But was a Puritan, right? It doesn't say that. Oh, okay. She, it just says she did not adhere to the religious doctrine of the Puritans. Oh, thank but, you. But believed in a covenant of grace. Thank you for correcting me. That's great. Thank God. Amen. That's a, listen, grace is, if, without grace, there's nothing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But grace and faith, faith man. <laughs> grace and faith work together. If there's no faith, grace won't do much. I've really hit a, not a bump in the road. I had a mountain. Amen. It landed right on my head. Thank God. I'm grateful to hear what this woman stood for. Let's go. They were expelled not long after that. And like others, they were moved to what became Rhode Island. William Coddington, John Clark, William and N. Hutchinson, along with John Coggeshaw and others, purchased Aquidneck Island from the Indians, facilitated by Roger Williams. 
They initially settled a Pocaset, which later became Portsmouth. They set up their government according to the law of Moses, and it seems William Coddington had the greatest influence over the group. He was named as judge, and John Coggershaw was one of the named elders. Although little is written of John Coggershaw, William Coddington's name appears in a number of histories. Samuel Gordon had also been exiled from Massachusetts County with great threatenings, including death. He came to Portsmouth, and there he again met with the government similar to the one he had just left. There was much dissension, and the administration of Coddington was ousted, and a civil government based on English law who was formed with the influence of Samuel Gordon, who, was, who although self-taught, was well-versed in English law. Samuel Gordon and many others did not believe government had the right to dictate man's conscience. William Hutchinson was appointed chief magistrate with Gordon as assistant. It was a government similar to our republic today. John Coggershaw, along with the other appointed elders, followed the ousted William Connington to another area and formed a new colony, which they called Newport. John Coggershaw was involved with the government there at Newport. There were years of strife and trouble between the colonies of Rhode Island and also Massachusetts Bay Colony, which is discussed at great length in Adelos Gordon's book, The Life of Times of Samuel Gordon. Adelos Gordon is one of Samuel Gordon's descendants. Amen. Right. In 1647, John Coggershaw served briefly as the president or chief magistrate of the colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation, which, in, which included the four colonies of Newport, Portsmouth, Providence, and Warwick. He died while serving in that capacity on November 27, 1647. So he died pretty young, in his mid-40s. John's son Joshua was born in England and came with his parents to New England. He also served in public office for many years. Joshua married Joan West and their daughter, Humility, married Benjamin Green. It is through hum Humility and Benjamin that Dole Davidson traces his ancestry to John Coggershaw. Well, praise God. And that Sherry Anthony you mentioned, uh, she has a main, just almost a straight main line right up to Coggershaw, from Coggershaw down to her second great-grandmother. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I will tell you, there's a tremendous resistance in the spirit to this. You know, when I talked to you this morning, I felt Coggershaw was the right way we should go. I didn't know, but uh, my head, and I've been here before. I'm not afraid. Amen. I'm not bothered. I'm overcoming a spirit. You see, my wrestling match is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, governments, powers, abilities, rulers of the darkness of this world. No, I think that's exousia, authorities. Rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in thy places. Uh, when I mentioned about the, the, the Hutchison woman, what she stood for, I started engaging in a spirit. That just moved. And, and I, I take great joy in this. Uh, I boast in glory and tribulation. I've learned to. 46 years of doing this, I didn't learn to run in tribulations, but to boast glory. Uh, Romans chapter 5 talks about this. I think it'd be good if we went there. Okay. And I want to show you some words that I think I'm right on. I've looked at them for years, but I think I am. You can start Romans 5, verse 1. All right. 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. I think that word, word glory there means boast. I believe it does. Somebody look that up. I'll look it up. All right. I, I'll tell you, I've learned to boast. Boast in the Lord, not your flesh. Right. But boast in the Lord and what he's done for the human race. What's in our hearts that believe. Amen. Thank God. Blessed be the day. Yes, it means in Strong's it says to boast. Boast, yeah. Isn't that amazing? You, you know what most people do? They get in tribulation. Oh, poor old me. No, no. Boast in the Lord. What great things he's done for you. What great things he has done. Uh, I guess... This is the right place. I didn't intend to do this. But at 3.30, about that, I woke up. I was awake to Well, awake. In my heart, when I woke up, Scripture, that, thank God, that the words of thy mouth and the meditation of thy heart be acceptable unto thee, O Lord. And, Whoso glorifieth God, whoso offereth praise, glorifieth me. And in the heart of this conversation, right, will I show the salvation of God. And I was there, way awake, and meditating on Jesus, 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 when those two scriptures appeared in my heart. I kept, then I moved to them, and I was like as though the Lord Jesus and Jehovah were standing, which is silly to say, I guess, but they were observing my heart and what I was saying. And it was amazing to think about about what was in my heart. So I just laid bare my heart to the Father and to Jesus. I held back nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I just would in a, a meditation. I've never done this. I've been at this 46 years. Now, I've never been like this. Thank God. And it was interesting. I went to things that were troubling. I went to a letter that Kathy D. and I should write uh, and other things, just meditating. And Everything was encouraging. When I got through in an hour, I told Kathy D. she had, was awake at that time, and I told her she looked the scriptures up. She looked in Psalm 4 4. Uh, would you read maybe Psalm 1, 4 1 through 4 or 5? Let's. Okay. Look at this. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. In 1973, God ministered to me, Psalm 91, verse 14, 15, and 16. 
uh, you can look at it, look at it on my website. But he said, when you call, I'll hear you. He did more than that. But as Katie read that to me, I thought, incredible. Stand in awe and sin not. In your meditation, don't be doubting. Sin not. Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever is not faith is sin. So don't be meditating in doubt. Meditate in faith. Oh, I was excited. I think that's my head's getting better. Amen. <laughs> Thank God pain's moving away. But what a blessing to me. Don't be meditating in doubt, but in faith. Because if you're meditating in doubt, it's sin. I was really, well, I'm getting charged talking about it. I thought, I don't want to tell this today. I don't even know if it's right. But I shared it. Three or four people, five, whatever. And man, things are lifting in the spirit. Thank God. Uh, let's go to 77. Psalm 77. I'm not sure what verse, but it talks about communing with my heart. I'll start in verse 1. All right. I cried unto God my voice, even unto God my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul met in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remember God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. The others mine eyes waking, I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Amazing. That's what I was doing. Amen. Just going over several things that troubled me. I wasn't sure I was right. In other words, I was doubting. <laughs> Amen. Mark eleven twenty three. <laughs> Would you read that? Sure will. Amen. Mark eleven twenty three. Well, verse 22 says, yeah. Have faith in God. Right. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Glory. Would you read the next verse? Therefore I say unto you, Whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. You know, there's a, a, oh, it's a silly statement about that, uh, Mark 11. But can we go to Matthew 21, uh, where the, about the fig tree? Uh, I think it is. But I was an Argyle, and it was amazing. God led me out there, and everybody thought I lost my mind for doing what I was doing, but it was God. And I heard some preacher preach on Mark 11, 23 and 24, and I thought, I don't know. And actually, they went back to the victory and said the next day, Peter noticed the victory had withered. We'll go to, I think, is it Matthew 21? Yes, it is. Well, let's read okay. that. Starting in verse 17. And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. When he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it 
and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? I want to correct this preacher a <laughs> hundred times, I guess. You ought to read the whole Bible. It says presently the big tree withered. It doesn't say in Mark 11 that it withered overnight. It doesn't say that. Not at all. Now I understand that sometimes what you pray doesn't manifest immediately. Do I ever know that? I've been walking in this 46 years and I've watched some things that didn't manifest for years. And you know, I know people don't necessarily like the Amplified Bible, but I pick something up in it. Ask. Keep on asking. Ask. Keep on asking. Yeah. You finally, and, and these preachers in those days would say, ask once, turn over the Lord. Yeah, tell the church what you need. <laughs> hey, man, I tell you, I'm overcoming some wicked spirits Amen. that I listen to today. But thank God I can see that pig tree dried up then. Now, like I said, not everything manifests immediately. But don't stop. Keep going what you believe. You all are noticing God <laughs> correcting my heart of doubt this day from the whole world. Do you think I care? Lord, no. If your pride is such that you can't be corrected before God, before the world, I feel sorry for you. I don't think I've arrived. But Lord, that doubt not. Said that I knew that was talking to me about don't meditate in doubt. But what I didn't know, there's something that's troubled me that a lot. And you know what the trouble is? Doubt. Doubt, doubt. Well, good night, doubt. <laughs> Glory. Uh, let's go some other direction. What do you say? Do you want to go back to the Rhode Island people? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Or go on to Chad Brown. Right. Amen. Chad Brown came to New England with his wife, Elizabeth, and their young son John about 1638 in the ship Martin. They landed in Boston, but historians write that not long after, he was exiled from Massachusetts for conscience sake and moved to Providence Plantation, joining with Roger Williams and the 12 original settlers of Providence. He was one of the signers of the Providence Compact, the first civil compact of the colony, which addressed disputes among the early settlers of the colony and those who came later. He was considered an arbitrator of the early colony, and Roger Williams mentioned him in a letter. The truth is, Chad Brown, that wise and godly soul, now with God, with myself, brought the remaining aftercomers in the first 12 to a oneness by arbitration. Brown was also appointed to a committee as a surveyor to list the town lots and the meadows allotted to them and also served on the committee to resolve boundary disputes between Pawtuxet and Providence. Later, while Roger Williams was in England obtaining an official charter of, for the colony, he served on a committee determining the governance of the colony. When Roger Williams separated himself from the Providence Church, 
Chad Brown became the minister and remained as such until his death, which has been stated as about 1665. He was buried on his own lot in Providence, but his and his wife's remains were removed to the North Burial Ground in 1792. It is believed Chad and Elizabeth had seven children, and Brown University is named after his descendant, Nicholas Brown, Jr., and is situated on part of the lot where Chad Brown lived. Doyle Davidson and David Casprite trace their lineage to Chad Brown through his son, John, who married Mary Holmes. Thank God. Um, you know, I'm really encouraged. <laughs> I hate doubt. I hate it. That's a, the worst thing you can do is doubt. I've been troubled. But I didn't know why. Well, now I know. Doubt. Stop doubting. That says in Mark 11, if you have faith and speak to this mountain and doubt not in your heart. Right? Right. Amen. You're going to have what you say. Amen. Thank God. <laughs> Some folks, hang loose. If you think I don't enjoy getting the will of God, you're mistaken. That's all I want. Thank God. What time is it? 11.36. 11.36. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I want a song. done by a friend of mine. The wings of a dove. Chick holiday. Amen. I have permission to do this. When trouble surrounds us, when evil comes, the body grows weak, the spirit grows numb. When these things beset us, he doesn't forget us. He sends down his love on the wings of a dove, on the wings of a snow white dove. He sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above.
wings of a snow white dove. Chico been ministered twice in this church back in the 80s. I met him. Good friend. I want to say this about doubt. You can have faith and doubt. That says that, Mark 11. I've got faith in a lot of things. And obviously, I had doubt in something. And God said, good place to get it out, do Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Paul's got a word from God. Uh, John chapter 20, I'll start in verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and saith, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they were remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Oh, man, man. you set me up. <laughs> you know, I wanted to see Jesus many years, many. I even went so far once, I said, just come and get in the back seat of my car and talk to me. I won't even look at you. You know what he said? You have believed and you have not seen me. What does that say? Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Well, thank God. Uh, I'm working on the Lord, or you are. You know, I was raised in religion. John Wesley Methodism. And they believe, they acknowledge what John Wesley taught. They didn't say so. They acknowledged it. Uh, a lot of people say it, but they, they don't even acknowledge it. I'm not saying the people I went to church with believed it. I'm saying they acknowledge it to be true. But I heard people say, well, it's okay to doubt. Thomas did. No, it's not. <laughs> I hate that. No, it's not all right to doubt. Repent of that now. Repent. And now, now, I have a friend that said once something to me. I said something to her about unbelief. I said, I hate unbelief. Now, maybe took a step and I said, and I ain't mine do. <laughs> Thank God, I do. I hate that stuff. There's nothing worse than doubt and unbelief. 
nothing. It's wicked. Real wicked. Thank God. Well, my head's much improved and my heart is moving forward. Amen. What time is it? 11.45. There, you got anything else? Uh, no, I did not. You did well. Amen. Well, I'll just say that there's a common phrase, don't be a, a doubting Thomas. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it comes right from here, from John 20. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, yeah, and the other is okay to doubt. Right. <laughs> no, well, there's no other name under heaven whereby one must be saved but Jesus Christ of Nazareth. No other name under heaven whereby one must be saved but Jesus Christ of that be born again be one with the Lord thank God be delivered thank God be saved receive Christ into your heart God has put faith in your heart to be saved no question about it just say the name Jesus after me you'll be born again be saved Take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus,